Morning. I just would like to check that we have um, is ready for the internet. Okay, then. Thank you very much and good morning and welcome to this seminar about uh, transforming Egypt. My name is uh, Lars Ekeman and I am uh, Secretary General for Society and Defense and uh, also the moderator for this uh, breakfast seminar. And uh, this will be about uh, Egypt, about the situation and uh, on the uh, coming elections, the 28th of November, so it's um, kind of, uh, how to say, a dramatic period when we could expect a new um, uh, parliamentarian uh, uh, company or, or um, well, a company who should uh, develop a new constitution for Egypt. And uh, we in Focus or we have had uh, earlier this year two seminars about uh, Egypt. One with two Swedish experts where we elaborated about uh, mainly the Arab Spring, but also the situation in Egypt. And uh, uh, in May we had um, our ambassador in uh, Cairo, Malin Charre, who was uh, explaining and telling us a little bit about the situation in Egypt. And this time we have the pleasure to welcome the ambassador from Egypt to Sweden, uh, Mr. Uh, Osama El Agdoub, uh, who has been ambassador here for two I think years. three years, two years, two years. So that is uh, quite a long time, I would say, for an ambassador in, in Sweden. But you are much welcome and um, have a long uh, diplomatic career in Egypt. Years now. But also uh, originally, originally an officer yes, in the armed forces, Navy. like myself. So we. Um, are very happy to have you here. You. So we have uh, decided that uh, you will um, give some thoughts about the situation and after that we will have a questionnaire and answering and discussion period. And uh, during this, don't forget that we must have use a microphone when you're telling or giving the questions. So um, the floor is yours. Thank Welcome. you. Thank you. Well, good morning. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank Mr. Ekman and the Institute for giving me this opportunity to talk to you about uh, some of the most interesting happenings that are taking place in Egypt today. And forgive my voice, because with winter, allergy kicks in and it's very bad. Uh, as you can see, I don't have a paper and I'm not going to give a lecture. I'm going to actually talk to you. And I'm not going to talk long to allow enough time for questions and answers and I'm sure there will be plenty of questions and hopefully equally plenty of answers on my part. <coughs> when I just walked in, I saw signs, no to military trials and free Ala Abdel Fattah, and I actually joined my voice to their voices, but in any case. You all know that Egypt has, over the past nine, ten months, has witnessed major changes, what we like to call our second or third revolution, based on which one are you counting as a revolution. And uh, when the people of Egypt took to the street, they were actually demanding very simple demands. They were demanding dignity, liberty, and social justice. And I don't know how did the people of Sweden perceive that, because for Swedish people and Western people in general, to demand these things, they don't need to have a revolution. But in our region, as interesting as we are, we do need a revolution to achieve these goals. Now, since that day, since the, the resignation of, of former President Mubarak on February 11 until now, a lot of events took place on the, on the street, in the corridors of the government, and elsewhere. Some of them were pleasant events. Some of them were very sad and very tragic events. But as we try to convince ourselves in Egypt, this is a transition period after a revolution. And transition periods are by nature unstable, unpredictable, and you don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. So you have to play it by ears. But in, in any case, the result of all the developments, the engagement, the turmoil that actually took place since February 11th till today is resulting in our hopefully first ever democratic election since the 1952 revolution. And I specify this date because actually the first parliament in modern Egypt was 135 years ago. <clears throat> and since that day, <clears throat> excuse me, we had 47 different speakers for the parliament. 
But since 1952, the system changed, and the, the 52 revolution at the time, so it fit that they should rule by themselves without a parliament because they were, in their own eyes, they were talented and imaginative people that they didn't need a parliament for the country, or at least not a functioning one. On the 28th of, of November, we will have the first stage of the parliamentary election. Second stage will be mid-March, and the third one would be 3rd of January. But why do we have three stages for the election? Because we have 50 million registered voters, so they cannot vote on one day. So we have to divide them by three different times. And since the constitutional declaration stipulates that, thank you so much, that uh, judiciary supervision should be effected at all times in all polling stations, and since we only have 10,000 judges, so we need to divide the process of election over three different stages. What will happen after that is that the elected parliamentarians will get together around, hopefully, March, and elect a constitutional committee of 100 members. Some of them might be from the parliament, some of them would be from outside the parliament, and this constitutional committee has six months period to write a new constitution for Egypt. A new constitution that respects human rights, a new constitution that uh, uh, respects the value of citizenship, reaching equality among all, putting everybody before the law as equal citizens. And since hunger makes people greedy sometimes, and since the Egyptian people were politically oppressed for so long, so now we have something like 58 different political parties running for the election, which is not a bad thing, actually. And uh, some of them started to realize that they're actually speaking the same language and saying the same thing. So they decided to merge together and run the election as a group. So we have two, three major groups that sort of host this big number of parties. Some of them have uh, different backgrounds. Politically and historically in Egypt, there are, I can say, four major political trends. There is the left, which was very powerful during President Nasser's time, and our, I wouldn't say alliance, but you can call it alliance with the Soviet Union at the time. There is the <laughs> Islamic background uh, trend, which has also been in Egypt for too long, even if it's not a political trend. There is the left wing, uh, I'm sorry, there's the nationalists, which also came from Nasser time, and those people are the ones that support the idea of Arab nationalism, support the idea of Arab unity. And then there is the new trend of liberal parties. And today we have seen on the ground that the liberal parties have the most difficulty getting the message through. One of the reasons for that is that the Egyptian people have not been introduced politically to what is known as liberal values before. Although before the 1952 revolution, the most important political party was El Waft party. But this party never actually introduced itself as liberal, although it was. It always called itself El Waft, the delegation. Then since 1952 revolution, we passed through a leftist socialist phase during our friendship with the Soviet Union. Then a more liberal economically uh, system during Sadat's time and the open door policy and the market economy that he applied and he started the new introduction of parties during his time. Then we have always had this Arab dream and Arab notion of having one Arab nation in the background. One of the other reasons why the liberals are facing such difficulty is that actually the word liberal is not Arabic. It's basically Latin or English. And that gave the opportunity to a lot of people who would like to compete with this trend to say that these are imported values that do not fit the society, this is even a translation from a foreign word, and so on and so forth. But recently, over the past especially few weeks, we started seeing the liberals on the street, trying to talk to the people, explain to them what liberal is all about. It doesn't mean we will become the United States in terms of value. It means we will become equal citizens, we will become free in our country, and so on and so forth. 
I have been asked so many questions and I don't want to preempt the questions because I'm sure people enjoy asking and I enjoy answering. But uh, since since the revolution took place and the whole political process started, I've been asked so many questions about the trend that has an Islamic background and how powerful it is on the street. And honestly, nobody can answer that question for you today. They claim that they have some kind of a majority. Other people claim they don't. When they ran in elections of, of syndicates, they got 20% of the votes. Is it going to be the same for the parliament? We will see. But as I have portrayed the challenges of the liberal trend, so does the Muslim trend also, or the Islamist trend has challenges, especially the Muslim Brotherhood. If you follow anything of the history of modern Egypt, Muslim Brotherhood was established in 1928 as a preaching group. And in 1938, they started to become a political entity. And since that time, under different governments and different rules, they have been an illegal, underground, clandestine, political preaching group that had followers and believers. Now, after the January Revolution, there is a structural shift and a paradigm shift for them because they are no longer a preaching group. They are actually turning into a political party. They no longer have followers in that sense. They actually have constituents. And their followers or constituents are not just supposed to be in the poor areas where they used to do charity work and give them cheap clothes or cheap food or even free food. No, they are running elections to run the whole country. So they address a different audience. The second challenge that they have, and, and let me first say that we have never known where does the money come from for the Muslim Brotherhood over the years. Today, I think as a political party, they are abiding by the law and they have to reveal the sources of their finance and where do they spend this money. The second challenge they have is more of a generational gap. This generational gap is very serious and very significant visibly in all of Egypt, but specifically in this group. Because during the revolution, the youth of the Muslim Brotherhood, who are very dedicated to their group, actually discovered that they have more in common with the other fellow youth from different trends than they have with their elder leaders of the group. And this is posing a very serious challenge for, for the leadership. Because surprisingly, Egypt, 60% of Egyptian citizens are below the age of 35. So we are a very young population. So old people like me and, and, and older have difficulty having their way around in there. And specifically for the leadership of the Muslim Brotherhood, because it's not only an older generation, it's a very conservative, heavy-handed, centralized, undemocratic process for them and, and, and structure. So all these differences make the, the outcome of the election actually anybody's guess. And I think we will be in for a very interesting run-up. And I'm sure we will have a very interesting parliament with different trends and different people. Again, I, I, was, I have repeated that so many times, and I hope none of you here has heard it from me before, so you don't hate me for it. But do not expect the end game yet. Do not expect a perfect parliament. Do not expect an ideal government. And do not expect a perfect constitution. It doesn't work that way. This is the first step that will allow that we change presidents every four years, something we've never known before. It's the first time in our history that we have a former president. We always had late presidents. So they are either on the ground or under the ground, <laughs> never existing and not in power. And this is a significant change. Never undermine that. We will have a parliament that we can change every four years. We will have a constitution that hopefully, and I'm sure definitely, will allow for liberty and freedom and equality among all. And we will have the possibility to discuss something called politics. In Egypt, if any of you has known Egypt before, politically, of course, not uh, when you go to visit the pyramids, you will know that Egyptian people were either demotivated or disinterested to talk about politics and sometimes even afraid. For them, talking politics was a taboo. It was a crime. Today, everybody's talking politics. Everybody's discussing laws. Everybody's asking about the Constitution, and they want to know what's in it for them, how is it going to change their lives, what are those people going to give them 
political parties, as we all know everywhere, talk too much and they talk very nice talk. And that could have fooled the people of Egypt before. Today, it doesn't work that way. They are very shrewd, they're open-minded. The amount of awareness that's spreading among the people on the streets from different walks of life and from different age groups is amazing. And uh, there are lots of, of groups that are not even running for election, but just their main mission is to educate the people how to run a country, what to expect from a parliamentarians, what's the difference between a parliamentarians and someone in the local council of a small city somewhere, what, what do they offer, how do you formulate a law, and so on and so forth. So I expect that, uh, that Egypt is witnessing and facing an interesting time, and I'm an optimist, but also a realist, and I know that what is coming in the future is definitely much better than what we had before. Now, this situation in Egypt and in the region posed a lot of other questions, like security issues, and this is a security institute, so we have to talk about that a little bit. And not only in Egypt, in the region, and we have witnessed a wave of revolutions or popular uprisings, starting with Tunisia, Egypt, we saw Libya, and now we are witnessing Syria and Yemen. And there are significant differences from one case to another. The Tunisians did it in 23 days, we did it in 18. The other poor countries are doing it for months and lots, lots of casualty and lots of dead people. In any case, we have to ask ourselves, although it looks bloody and, and sad and tragic, but what are those people seeking? They are seeking democracy. So let's hope that the outcome of all this ordeal would be democracy. Now, how does that have an impact on security in the region? Well, I think democracy cannot have a bad impact when it comes to security. If it's proper democracy, then that's what we are all seeking. <coughs> a lot of people ask me questions about what would be the relationship of Egypt with Israel and with the United States. And these are valid, legitimate questions. And I tell them what I'm going to tell you. Egypt is not a banana republic. It's a very old state that respects international commitments and agreements and treaties that it has signed, whether it's under the former regime or Muhammad Ali when he was running the country. We have agreements as old as 1888, and it is the one that's actually regulating the Swiss Canal. So imagine all your ships go through the Swiss Canal based on an agreement that was signed 1888. So we respect our commitments. We have no intention of violating our peace treaty with Israel. And we always say, if you respect it, we respect it. It's mutual and reciprocal. I didn't understand why there were questions about our relationship with the US, for instance. It is a strategic relationship that goes up and down based on the behavior and the conduct of both parties. If we both do it right, we are good friends and we cooperate and communicate. If something goes wrong, it's not always a honeymoon. We will definitely have difficulties. We will definitely have differences. Our relationship with the EU is one of the oldest relationships that we had with Europe in general, and not specifically the EU. And there is a nostalgic and a cultural bond between Egypt and Europe. For, for the most part, because we have been occupied by almost everybody from Europe over the history. <laughs> and yet, this is the beauty of my country, and I'm not bragging about it. Anyone who came to Egypt and left something, this something was magically Egyptianized somehow and became ours and became part of us. And secondly, because if you ask any simple Egyptian on the street, how would you like to see your country? He would think for a moment and say, mm, like Europe. For them, Europe is clean and orderly and nice, and people are living happily in prosperity and freedom and liberty. So our relationship with Europe, partly human and social, as you can see, and partly legal, because we have agreements with Europe that regulate the relationship and allow for better cooperation and uh, trade and facilitation of a lot of things. I promise not to talk much. And I'm not going to talk more than that. I would, if that's okay with you, I would open the floor for questions and answers, and I will be happy to answer any question.
Thank you very much for this interesting uh, introduction and, and um, speech about Egypt. Now we will open up for questions, and I will take the privilege to start. I can all see here that there's um, a lot of persons already. But I would like to ask you about uh, um, uh, the, the origins, so to say, of the revolution and about the social changes in the society. You mentioned uh, the young people, that it's uh, over um, 60%, I think it was, was yeah. under 30. Five. Under 30, 35. Yeah, th um, 35. That's um, a very huge part of the population. And uh, I uh, sub imagine that most of these people are well educated as well. They have been into school and many of them have been into university. So there it, it must have been a significant change in society during the last, for lot of, so to say, 20 years. How important is this part of the population, both for, for um, the re revolution itself, but also for the future development into, uh, into, into as we hope, a democratic um, constitution and a state? What do you say about... Well, thank uh, you for asking this question. First of all, uh, the young population of Egypt was actually the driving force behind the revolution. And it is also the target audience of the, of the uh, revolution. And uh, one of the most important changes that should happen is improving the quality of living for them and offering better job opportunity, which was not the case apparently. And most importantly, offering good education because the education in Egypt has been good for, for decades, and then it was deteriorating <coughs> badly over the past 20 years. And through education, you can change the world, and you can do anything you want. So one of the most important agenda items that the revolution will have after having a parliament and a government is improving the education for those people. And it's, it is among uh, these part of the population you will find uh, support for a more liberal uh, uh, approach for life. Yeah, how, if you would speculate in any figures, how, how, how many persons, is it's half mean, of them or um, one third? Or well, let me tell you something. The latest uh, survey that was made across the country, and not only for the youth, 75% of the people were for liberal values and civil state. 23% were for a country with a religious background, and 1% supported military mm. rule. Oh, interesting. 1%. <laughs> well, let's, uh, I would like to ask you to introduce yourself, where you come from, and, and short your name as well, please. Thank you. Uh, my name is Farida. I am from Sudan, but uh, I am Nubian. Yeah. And uh, after Egyptian built High Dam, our, uh, my homeland, my home uh, town, was flooded, and we have been forced to move to eastern part of Sudan. And there, we were locked in remote villages without any, I <coughs> mean, um, just basic uh, uh, surfaces, which was not good until now, and we are suffering a lot. S and even here in the north of Sudan, we are suffering a lot. And uh, although the, we, are, uh, must, uh, we are very much uh, impacted with the high dam, till now we didn't get even a kilowatt of electricity. We are in the darkness until now. And people are ignorant, are uh, marginalized, from both sides, mm. from both government in the two countries. So I am asking Mr. Ambassador, is that going to be changed? Because it is fair to be fair now to Nubians. Mm. And they are suffering really a lot of, a lot of problems in both areas. Mm. Thank you very much for this uh, question. Please, Mr. Thank Ambassador. Thank you for the question. Well, as you have put it very eloquently, this is a very old problem. And although it's a very old problem, and although the current government that we have today is a transition government, one of the first subjects the government took up and actually formulated a scientific and social committee to study the solution was concerning the Nubian problem. So yes, this problem will definitely be addressed and it will be solved completely. I yeah, promise you that. No, no, that, that has already <laughs> happened. Yeah. That has already happened over the past 20 years. We are going to undo that. For, uh, 
Yes. Yes. Yes, we hope so. Thank you very much. We we jump to the next questioner, please. Okay. <clears throat> My name is Lisa Berg, and I'm uh, representing Amnesty International. And uh, we are concerned, among other things, about women's role in uh, the building of a new Egypt, and uh, especially about the exclusion of women uh, as uh, policy makers, as we see it, because we we. Uh, so far, we have seen that uh, women have been grossly underrepresented uh, in the bodies shaping the new Egypt. For instance, there were no uh, women uh, part of the um, uh, Constitutional Amend Amendment Committee that was um, established in March 2011. So my question is how you foresee women's participation in uh, policy making in, for the f in the future. Thank you very much. Uh. First of all, a small correction. The, the entities that exist today are not the ones shaping the future of Egypt. They are just running Egypt through the transition <laughs> period. You are absolutely right about the underrepresentation of women over the past few months. But actually, the Constitutional Committee was represented of only one element, and I'm not going to name that element because it's politically incorrect to do that. It was not very well represented, representative of the society in general. And uh, if you follow what's happening in the election today, in the nomination, and the number of women nominated to the parliament, you will be pleased. There is a very great importance attached to the presence of women on the lists of parties and on the individual nominations. And many of them are on top of the lists, if you, if you know what it means to be on top of the list. I think I would like to see, but that's not up to me, but I think women will play a very important role in shaping the future of Egypt, starting by parliament and later on in the government and other entities. I wouldn't stop much over the transition period because actually the mistakes were many. The disorientation was very visible during this period and it's a transition period. So I don't stop much and overanalyze. For me, the transition period is just a detail. The future is more important, but thank you for the question. Thank you. It's, uh, this is an uh, important and um, interesting uh, issue. If you look at Tunisia, one could also see in the beginning of uh, the process there, it was a lot of uh, women into the process. But uh, as far as I uh, understand, uh, the development now has had um, uh, resulted in that it's less women into the political structures in the new Tunisia and it's it seems that it's some kind of uh, force we, we really don't could decide over who is pressing uh, the f women's back into no influence uh, is, is it the difference between Egypt and Tunisia in this perspective well they are at the stage uh, a bit advanced uh, as compared to us because they have already done the election and we know the result we have not done the election in Egypt, but I can say, yes, it is different. Judging by the names of candidates on the lists for the parliament and the number of women there, I don't know if they will succeed, but they mm. are on the lists. And uh, yeah, I can say so far, to be accurate, that yes, so far it's different. But then we'll see the outcome of the election and we can talk again. Oh, thank you. Please. Uh, Anders Milton, previous president of, of this organization some years back. A question touching upon what Lars Ekeman was talking about, the, uh, your population, the demography. How do you see, uh, the sort of as it would, could be, the clash between the hopes that you have today, the population has today, and, and the reality, which means that creating jobs, having a good future, and normally that takes longer time than people would like to hope. Yeah. And how do you see the risk for, for the, the young people wanting a job and a future? How do you see the risk for them going into populistic political movements on either side of the of the middle road as it were well i would be concerned about uh, about uh, employment and about uh, the impact of unemployment on the population but i would not be so much concerned about the youth moving into a radical direction first of all there would be definitely some kind of a clash between the hopes and the situation on the ground but on the other hand, and we have seen that during the transition period, that the demands were very high from different segments of society, 
and they all had the right for these demands, but the timing was difficult. But the problem, and, and that again was part of the difficulty that we faced with the government during the transition period, the response was not even theoretical in, in, in terms of that you tell the people, listen, this is the situation today, these are the resources, we have this plan, so bear with me, in three years it will be better. Had they done that, it, things would have been much better. And I think the same applies after, after having an elected government. If the government has a vision and a clear, honest plan, a credible plan, that will be introduced to the people, the Egyptian people can be very patient in that sense. But if there is no such plan, it could be difficult. Thank you. And um, we turn over to the next, please. Yes, hello. My name is Bo Lundin. I'm working a little with looking for possibilities for companies in uh, Western companies to grow in former locked countries. And uh, what I'm interested in, in is uh, can you see uh, in the future that, uh, for example, Western companies should be more interested to invest in your company and through that way take care of all these young, well-educated people and balance between women and girls and so, sorry, and so on. Because I think there is a challenge for you because uh, in Western Europe we like to employ women for, example, women, for example, in the company. So it helps to create the balance. And of course, also people need work. Mm. And then it's an easier way for democratic process. So can you see an opening with better context commercially? Yeah, I mean, um, well, it, uh, this is my kind of talk. I like to talk about business and companies coming to invest in Egypt. But you make it sound like Egypt was close to foreign investment before. And it was not. Actually, Egypt has always been open to foreign investment, be it from Western Europe, as you called it, or from East Asia, as, as anywhere else. The issue of, of gender equality in employment is not going to be, I think, that difficult because there is no clear discrimination against women in the job market in that sense. And definitely there is no discrimination in terms of reward. If a man and a woman get the same job in Egypt, they get paid the same amount of money and they get the same benefits, unlike some Western European countries, as, as you put it. So, but yes, of course, it, I think uh, any investment in the right place, as long as it's not an investment that's against the interest of the country, of course, then, then it's most welcome. And any attempts for gender equality are, are definitely welcome. I don't think you will have difficulty doing that. Thank you. If we keep to the economy, and um, as far as I, I understand, so it's tourists. Tourism is very important in Egypt and also agriculture for, for the economic... Uh, development but uh, what, what are the most important steps who should be taken to to move ahead in the economic development of the country well that's also an important question as far as tourism is concerned the most important step will start on the 28th of november and that is political stability because we already have the infrastructure for the tourism we have the hotels we have everything what we need is tourists so once we stabilize the country and they start coming back that would be good Agriculture, there are ambitious plans to expand the, the land that is cultivated in Egypt and to try to achieve self-sufficiency in strategic commodities like wheat and corn and things like that. And there is a hope and, and a will to, to expand in industrialization as well, not just count on agriculture. Because uh, the EU, our biggest partner in agriculture, is very restrictive when it comes to agriculture and very generous when it comes to industrialized goods. So we will make use of that and have more industry in Egypt. Okay, thank you. And, and maybe also, if I could yes. end up this um, economic discussion with, with the issue about the military influence in the economic uh, fields. Uh, as far as I understand, a lot of companies that run 
by military officers and are connected also to, to uh, the military forces. Uh, what are your thoughts about that and what would be um, the possible development in the future in this perspective? This is very difficult to, uh, to speculate on. I know that a good number of companies is owned and run by, by the military and they produce consumer commodities like juice and water and food and, and things like that. I don't know how was the system before. I don't know if they paid taxes. I don't know. So that would be mm -hmm. a, a strong issue of debate after we, we start having yeah. an elected government, definitely. Thank you. It's um, yeah. kind of a little bit difficult question. Uh, I don't have yeah. an answer for it. I <laughs> no. mean, it's not that I have an answer and I don't want to say it, but uh. actually I don't have the answer mm. for it. Uh, well, thank you. And uh, please, we we'll go to the next. Yes, uh, my here. name is Fabia Midman. I represent, among other things, the Euromed civil platform, where Egypt is a very important partner. Uh, my question is, uh, following up to Mr. Ekman's, uh, the role of the military has been very visible lately, and it has scared many in the sense that the military is doing everything in its uh, might to maintain the power share it has had in the past, which is understandable because there was no other system. And um, my question is, I am very confident about the democratic moves in Egypt. And um, do, you look like, do you look at the way Turkey moved on by pushing the, the military slightly aside and introducing a democratic system that is now quite admired by many and also giving more stability to the whole. Being also an Islamic country, it is a novelty that uh, and a contradiction to those who think that Islam is not democratic. Uh, Turkey has shown that it could be, and Egypt has had some democratic thinking without the political dimension. So there is a kind of tradition, and um, this is what I want to know. Thank you. Thank you. Well, this is also one of, of the frequent questions that I get asked. But let me get back to your first question. I will disagree with the statement you made that it is obvious the military is doing all its might to stay in power. I don't think that's the case at all. I think the military is keen on maintaining a status for the military that is sufficient, in their opinion, to keep a strong and classified military, to put it that way. But to stay in power, I haven't seen the military using all its might to stay in power. I, I haven't seen that. I cannot agree with that. Not that I would approve it. I would be personally against it, but it's not the case. Uh, the Turkish model. I think we hear that question a lot. And um, I can understand where is it coming from, although I'm not convinced. Because the Turkish model is a very unique model, and it's a result of accumulation of several layers of history. It started with Kamal Atatürk, with a certain very strong, powerfully secular vision for Turkey. And he embedded that in the constitution of Turkey. And also, in the same constitution, he embedded a very significant role of the military to be the guardian of secularism. So we have a situation here where the constitution actually gives a lot of power to the military versus the political powers, which has never been the case in the Egyptian constitution and will not be the case in the new one. What the government of Turkey is doing today, I, as, as I understand it, is streamlining this power of the military gradually. How can I repeat something that I don't have? We don't have the situation in Egypt. Even if the army has had power or the military has had power over the years, it was a de facto power. It was an on-the-ground power. It was not a power stipulated in the Constitution. So my answer would be, I don't think we can repeat the Turkish model because we have totally different circumstances and situation. Now, for uh, Islamic government being democratic or not democratic, if you're talking about the values of Islam as a religion, 
It's a very democratic uh, religion. And if you understand the religion correctly, it calls for democracy and respect of human rights. If you talk about the practice on the ground, then you will judge each case by its own experience. I mean, and, and this is actually the, the sad part of it, is that if Turkey is, is doing a great democratic ruling and it's a government that's affiliated to the Muslim background, then people would say Islamic democracy is good. If some other country, without naming names, is using this religious background to manipulate and to become a tyranny over people, then people would say that Muslim democracy is not good or that Islam and democracy are contradictory. Let's hope that we will have in the future, in the near future, more examples that people will use to say that democracy and Islam can go along. Thank you. Oh, thank you very much. Uh, also, a very interesting uh, issue, this, with the role of the military. And um, and uh, we, uh, it's a lot of people here who want to ask questions. So we move uh, straight well, forward, please. I have the time. It's up yeah. to you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, hello. My name is Christian Westling. I'm coming from the Syrian Democrats, uh, a party in the parliament, a parliamentary party. Uh, first of all, thank you for a uh, very interesting uh, uh speech about uh, the situation in Egypt. Uh, I was very uh, uh, glad to hear that uh, you told uh, you told us that that the that the um, democratic um, situation in Egypt is better than uh, most of the other countries around uh, around Egypt. Uh, for example, Libya where you have uh, a lot more problems with uh, I didn't say that. No, no, but no, but you you told me about, about how good it is in in Egypt. But Let's uh, let's uh, if if we had a s scenario in the near future, if we have Libya as a more uh, Islamic country, uh, which uh, which there is a, a risk of, how would you say wh what would how would a newly elected liberal uh, government in Egypt uh, be handling um, a, Li a Libya more uh, Islamic, and especially if you have a vocal, a small but yet vocal. Um, uh, opposition with the Muslim Brotherhood in Egypt. How how would that government tackle that problem? Uh, and that's one question. And uh, another question is how do you see the future Egypt handling the Christian situation with the uh, with the Copts and uh, their situation? Thank you. Good issues. A question. Yeah, but I, I have a few <laughs> remarks on the formulation of the question. First of all, you said the risk of having an Islamic state in in uh, in Libya. I don't see that as a risk. Secondly, you said, how is Egypt going to deal with the problem? I don't see that as a problem. Why? Because it's a prejudgment that if a government comes to a country with an Islamic background, that's going to be a bad government, and that's incorrect. It all depends on the perception of the government and how do they understand their own religion and how do they apply it. If they understand it properly and apply it properly, then this is going to be a good government for its own people if they choose it democratically. If they are going to be radicals, we all hate radicals, be it in Muslims or elsewhere. We all hate fanatics that, uh, that are xenophobic or supportive of a certain belief against all other beliefs. So I don't think it, uh, it would be a problem if a moderate, democratically elected government in Libya or elsewhere with a Muslim background would be in power. I think we will deal with them and at the end of the day, it's interest that is important and national security. The second question was, has to do with the Coptic, you call it the Coptic situation. Burning, churches and stuff like that. Burning the churches is something that was coinciding with a specific security apparatus that was there and was plotting against the people trying to get them to enter into sectarian rift and sectarian sedition. During 18 years of the revolution, 18 days of the revolution, when we had no security on the street, we haven't seen a single incident. Ch Christians and Muslims have been living together in Egypt for 1400 years, and we have only seen burning of churches over the past few months. And it has been politically motivated, and everybody knew at the time that it was not a mainstream act. We have 3,000 churches in Egypt for Christians. We don't have like six or ten that it's difficult for them to go and, and practice and pray. And after the repetition of this incident, that once and twice and three times, some people were burning churches, 
on every religious occasions for the Christians, thousands of Muslims were protecting the churches in Cairo and Alexandria and elsewhere. So we don't have a Coptic situation. We have legitimate demands by the Copts concerning certain things that are not addressed properly by the former government, like their existence or presence in certain jobs or intensity of their presence in certain jobs, like, for instance, teaching their history in schools because it's part of Egypt's history. These are legitimate demands, like facilitating issuing licenses to build churches. And this is an issue that's being addressed right now as we speak because in Egypt they are formulating a single law for building worship houses, be it a mosque or a church or, a, or something else. So they do have legitimate demands. But uh, I wouldn't call it the Coptic situation in that sense. I would call it the legitimate demand of the Coptic Egyptians. That will, I think, I am absolutely certain, will definitely positively addressed by the new government that's democratically elected. Thank you. Uh, maybe I just have a follow-up there. Please. One, one um, uh, as I understand, uh, the military council decided that uh, there's a burned church who was lately burned down, should be rebuilt. So that that's a good sign that that they handled this situation in in uh, well in a good manner. But how is the trend then? I mean, this is a new phenomenon, isn't it? Yeah, With it these is. clashes. And this has uh, this started uh, really, one could say, in a one perspective, the revolution. But is Egypt into a trend with a more harder relationship between Christians and uh, Muslims, like we have in, in some places also in Europe? Mm. What would you say about this? I don't think so. I think that, okay. A lot of people don't like the conspiracy theory. I am one of them. But I cannot help but say that there is something happening. Because, like mm. you said, it's a new phenomenon. We have never seen something like that no. in, in, in the history of Egypt or, or even other Muslim countries for that sense. We have seen uh, mosques being burned in some parts of the world. I don't have to name countries or destroy it. But we have never seen churches being burned down. And when it happens coinciding with the revolution, we in Egypt believe, and by we I mean Christians and Muslims alike, Egyptians, that this is part of the counter-revolution. And one of the most significant and fatal weapons that you can use against the Egyptian society is the sectarian sedition, is the ethnic rift. Everybody knows that. Because Egypt is not uh, like the situation, for instance, in the Sudan, where the Christians were geographically located in the south and with, with, of course, a minority of others, and with different language and different ethnicity, it's not like that. If you walk on the streets in Egypt, you cannot tell who's Muslim and who's Christian. So we will fix this in time, mm. I'm sure. If, we've, if we succeed to eradicate the counter-revolution, I think this will disappear with it. Good to hear. Well, we go to uh, the next slide over there. Uh, hi, my name is Anna. Uh, I have three questions. Uh, three? First, yeah, three, okay. but they're fast ones. So, um, well, first of all, uh, the election has been postponed. Uh, oh, not now. I, th I see the fear in your face. Uh, no, but I meant earlier. It was uh, said to be in October and now November. How can we be sure that it will actually take place this time? Uh, and my other question is. Um, wh what are your thoughts about military courts being used against civilians? As I heard, have started now and uh, lastly we uh, just now spoke about Christians and Muslims and uh, I think that your thoughts were very um, well I liked what you said uh, but uh, how about the military's actions against the Christian de demonstrator as Ms. Piero? I would really like to hear your thoughts on that. Sure. Well first of all the election has not exactly been postponed it was uh, a stage of ambiguity because the constitutional declaration said that the election process will start in September. And at that time, everybody thought that we will go to the ballot boxes on September. But the interpretation came that the process should start in September. And it did start in September, but to conduct the election in November. Only yesterday, the committee confirmed there is no postponement for the election. And if you see the work my embassy is doing to receive the Egyptians living here to vote, you will know that if they postpone it, I'm going to kill myself. So, 
<laughs> so this is the first question. A second question concerning the concerning military, courts military courts. There is a very strong public opinion in Egypt, and I mean strong landslide against military trials of, of civilians. And um, Friday, 18th of November, there is going to be a huge demonstration, not only in Tahrir Square, but in other places, among other things, to say no to military trials. So far, they, they are still happen. According to the army, they happen only in the cases where a crime is committed against the army, a facility or uh, an equipment or an officer of the army, and even that is rejected by the political forces in Egypt and saying, no, a civilian should be tried before a civilian court. It's, it's an uphill fight, and we will see how is it going to, to end. But the people are not letting down, and so far we have not heard the final word from the army, so we'll see about that. Now, the... Well, that was a tragic situation. And uh, it was condemned and deplored by everybody, including myself. And I'm not supposed to say that on camera, but I'm saying it. And there is an investigation taking place. There, there was a fact-finding mission from human rights organizations. And there is an investigation. I hope we... <coughs> can know the outcome of the investigation. We need to know who did what and what was the punishment for them. I'm sure there will be trials, and those trials will include someone, for some people from the military. We are entrusting the people who conduct the investigation, and we are waiting to see the result of this investigation. My only remark is that I don't want to, I'm very sensitive about Egyptians in general, and I don't want to call it the army action against Copts in the demonstration. It was the army action against the demonstration. They did it with the Copts, they did it with those who were marching towards Abbasiyah, and they were not Christians, they were Egyptians. So unfortunately, this was a Christian march or demonstration. Yeah, but I totally agree with hmm. you. Yeah. It was Christians, it's about yeah. Yeah, it's very sad. And we will wait and see the result of the investigation. I hope that it would be announced soon. Thank you. Thank you. And I know that we will go to stick to this subject, the military and uh, civilian society. So please, next. Hey, Mr. Ambassador. My name is Ramses from Egypt. And uh, our friend here, she came with the two questions, actually, I wanted to ask about. But uh, two things I want to talk about. The first one, since the revolution, the SCAF, the Supreme Council of Security Forces, uh, uh, they try to accelerate all the activists or the liberists in the political side in Egypt from the political side at all. So they are not active in somehow. And we can see that through the attacks of the military police against them in uh, the square, in Tahrir Square, Latest, uh, latest in Maspero, and it wasn't only Christians, it was Christians and Muslims who have been marching together against the media of the, the, the state media and the military council. Since that time, they tried to accelerate them from the whole side. And we, we can see that 12,000 uh, activists, it can be also thugs in, in between who are in, uh, in front of uh, or before the military uh, trials. But still, the right for a civilian to be in front of a civil court is the main thing. And for that, the Egyptians are going on the 18th of November in a million march. What, and this million march having some oppositions uh, against this. So it can be a blood river in Egypt. What can the military road, uh, the military, uh, the, the council do for Saving Egypt from such a situation on 18th, Egyptians are killing each other, and it can be also against military that the military itself can take an order attacking the people. This is number one. Number two is, uh, like two weeks ago, uh, a court in Mansoura uh, get a resolution banning the members of the National Democratic uh, Party being candidates in the election on the 28th of, of November. 
why would the government which came after the revolution with a man who uh, sweared in front uh, in front of people in the middle of Tahrir Square that he will protect the revolution it is the government which uh, objected against this resolution from the uh, the court so what is the plan if right now the most organized play, uh, people in the political side in Egypt is the Muslim Brotherhood and the ex-members of the National Democratic Party. Thank you. Hmm. Thank you very much. First of all, uh, I would like to ease your fear concerning the 18th of November. There is not going to be any bloodshed or Egyptians killing Egyptians. And as we have seen over the past few months, when there is a million march on Tahrir Square, Actually, what happens is that the army and the police clear the square. They disappear. And this is an agreement. It's an arrangement. And it is the youth committees, as you know them during the revolution, that organize the security around the square. And that has proved to be very effective. They make sure that nobody enters with any kind of weapon or any kind of even sharp object, for that matter. So I don't really expect a lot of turbulence. And usually judging by the pattern, when, when it is a sit-in demonstration in a closed place, it's much better secured than when it is a march from one point to another. And all the incidents that happened, happened in marshes, not in demonstrations. So I can, I can ease your mind and tell you, don't worry, there will not be a bloodshed on the 18th of November. This is one. Secondly, there was media reports saying that the government objected to the ruling and that is incorrect. The government did not and cannot object to the ruling. It was the people of NDP themselves, the National Democratic Party, that actually filed a, law a lawsuit with the uh, High Administrative Court and it was the High Administrative Court that said that this court that made the, the, the ruling is not entitled to look into such kind of matters. So it was not the specialized court to decide whether someone should run for an election or not. We tend to overestimate, personally, this is my personal opinion, it's not, I'm not as an ambassador or as a, a government official, but as Osama, the power of, of the NDP. If you follow the elections that took place before, the best result they ever got actually before the forgery was 30 to 35 percent of the votes. They never got more than that. So, and that was then. This is now. So if they have to run, let them run. And I don't think that they would really matter much in, in the coming uh, parliament, because the people know differently today. This is my hope, at least. Well, um, well, well, okay. One uh, sh very short comment. But the point is, uh, if those people in the election who, of course, in most of the places in Egypt, it's tri uh, tribes and uh, families, big families and people having money and they are trying to buy the voice of the people who are going to vote. So when it's happening that those people from the old time, the old members of the parliament through the NDP, they are the people who are coming again now, and they are the people who are going to make our the, our new constitution. So how the people we are revolting against, they are the ones making uh, the new constitution for us. I, I'm not saying that it's not a matter of concern. I'm saying that we should not exaggerate or overestimate the risk. This is one. Secondly, what you said was, was very powerful, buying buying votes and things like that when it was elected by the individual system that you elect a person. Today, two-thirds of the seats are lists. When you elect, you elect the list. Then one-third is only individual votes. So the relative weight of families and money has been significantly reduced by applying the list system. Thirdly, even those families that were associated with the National Democratic Party, if they have any sense or any intelligence on their heads, they will know that associating themselves today to the same party will actually ruin their interest and their business. So relax. <laughs> it will be okay. Well, thank you very much. And uh, I'm uh, really sorry. We have um, uh, much more people here who would like to put questions on the really floor. But uh, we have to, we have always try to keep uh, you should time. end in the right time and you should start in, end in, in the right time. But um, this has been most interesting. 
a lot of interesting views and um, I must say you are very well informed about the situation. It has been very interesting to, to listen so to this. And um, as an ambassador, I, I, we know that you have to sign maybe sometimes very important documents and um, maybe we could uh, add some value to this with, to present you with a royal pencil from the <coughs> royal court. Thank you so, so much. Please. Thank you very much That's for this morning. Yeah, I would like to. Yeah. Yeah.